Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. We're back for our live stream. As always, we're here Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And I'm joined by two amazing Sophias, just for extra confusion. <laughs> so if you're watching on YouTube, uh, come along. We're on Behance Live um, and have a live chat where you can talk to us and ask some questions today. We'll be here for a full hour. So everyone in the chat, I'll say hi in a second. But firstly, hello, Sophia's. If you have an, like an idea for nicknames hi. in the chat, we'll take that. Yeah, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> a bit easier. So on the one hand, I have Sophia Pusa, who's joining from London. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Nice. And we're super excited to have you as well, because I'm joined by Sophia Emmerich as well, who's our co-host today. I kind of jumped on, Sophia. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, I mean... I think everyone in the chat, I'm just already looking, is quite excited that you're here. So we just, I think it's going to be perfect, just the three of us together. And That's also for funny. the confusion, I think it's way funnier that we're like, <laughs> yeah. yes, it just makes it a bit more interesting. And people will guess a lot of times who's actually, <laughs> like, who's the question <laughs> aimed at. <laughs> but maybe you can also both answer. <laughs> and then exactly. we can really fill the hour. <laughs> yeah, we could talk at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> And who do we have in the chat today? We have Sandrine, we have Andreas, we have Caroline, Sean, um, Anna, Laura. We have a lot of people here today. So I think we're going to have a nice hour. Jackie is also here. So please send questions. Um, whatever comes to mind. Yeah, I'm sure Sophia will be here to answer them, both of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess I will. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure in like half an hour we won't find it funny anymore don't worry <laughs> we'll keep going um, but Sophia I'll let you introduce yourself uh, but you're you know an illustrator art director graphic designer pretty much all-round creative um, from Finland who is based in the UK so take it away introduce yourself to everyone who's watching at home yeah, so hi everyone. So like I just said, I'm Sofia. I'm, I'm from originally from Finland, but, but we actually uh, moved to London in last November, which was a pretty crazy time to move uh, in the middle of uh, the pandemic. Uh, but I just love it here. It's, it's been really nice. And um, um, so I'm an art director, graphic designer and illustrator. Uh, I work mainly with branding projects, but like, uh, and also in illustration. But uh, I think my projects range from like websites to editorial design and even motion graphics. So there's a lot of variety, which I think is really fun. And uh, well, for those who uh, don't know my work, I can show you like a quick preview. So here are some selected projects from a couple of past years. I guess I'm kind of like mostly known for my like bold color use and combining illustration with branding. But it's actually quite funny because at the moment I'm working on a couple of visual identity projects, which are both like really minimal and like mostly typographic. So, but I think that's kind of the beauty of this work that you can always like keep evolving and like learning new things. And so, yeah, that's, I think it's a lot of fun. Super nice. I already, we talked a little bit last week about this, but I love your use of colors and patterns. Thank and that's you. something I'm excited to talk about. Um, it's part, and actually someone in the chat already you know, spotted this, but we have a strong Finnish presence here today. <laughs> and so we'll talk a little bit about your background and where this all started. Um, but I know there's also this culture for patterns and, um, you know, design kind of hunger in Finland. And I'm really excited to find out a little bit more where, yeah, this all came from for you. Um, so yeah, beautiful work. Sophia, anything else? <laughs> you, um, her. This one. Yeah, the Sophia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here we go. We have like an awkward. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> can I ask a question or? Um, you, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, because question time. Yeah, question time. No, I'm just gonna jump in. Uh, question time because I know and I find that extremely interesting and um, important to talk about that you studied something kind of 
let's say not a creative profession per se um that you studied business if i'm correct and you decided to switch over to a different career and it's kind of the same thing that happened to me and i know how difficult that oh, process really? is and i would really like to hear how that worked out for you how long it took because for me it was like almost 10 years and um yeah a little bit about the background how did you end up creating all this amazing art and graphics that you do now Yeah, absolutely. I would love to hear your story as well. I got so interested in <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> But yes, um, I definitely took the winding path to becoming a designer. I uh, Do you want the long or the short version? I want the <laughs> long version. I, find, I think it's so interesting to hear because it's so inspiring for other people. Like you don't have to have this straight CV, which is like I've known from since I was five that I wanted to be exactly this one thing. It's so interesting to hear all these yeah, my path. different stories. Yeah. Yeah, my path definitely was anything but straightforward. Um, well, like I was always like as a kid, I was really creative and I, I was drawing a lot. And I, I remember I was like drawing these butterflies that were so big that they would like take up almost half of the page. And I remember also like cutting letters from like old magazines and newspapers and like, like compiling them into these ran random notes. But like, of course, it never even occurred to me at that age that like typography or graphic design was actually like a thing. And I was also studying in an upper secondary school, I guess it's like high school for some other countries, uh, which was focused on arts. But still, like, uh, although I was like surrounded by all those creatives, I, I never thought about like that I could really have like a creative career. I don't know, I, I guess I was somehow like programmed to believe that art is like a good hobby, but not a mm -hmm. good profession, if you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, that's what people told me all the time. They're like, you can do that on the side. It's totally fine if you just want to do that yeah. to, I don't know, have something to do on the weekends. But I've, yeah, it's, I don't know how it is for you, but I was also not surrounded by people that had that as a profession. It was more of like very straightforward lawyers, doctors. This is kind of, that's a job. <laughs> Everything else is just yeah. for fun. Yeah. Exactly. I also had lawyers and doctors around me and um, I didn't have any role models. And I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah. And like so after upper secondary school, I uh, actually went to uni for a year and I was studying things like aesthetics and Latin and French. But like after a year in the university, I just I felt like, okay, I, I'm going to need more like direction in my life. So I applied for business school. Um, I got in and then I kind of ended, ended up uh, graduating from there. Um, But actually, like when I was studying business, I kind of always had this hunch, like a feeling that like my life was not as fulfilling that it could be. But um, I also did an exchange period in Mexico City. And I, I was also volunteering in Ecuador in Latin America, where I kind of embarked on like really serious soul searching. And I guess like in Mexico, like surrounded by all that amazing art and culture. And I mean, I think people, they were so kind. I just like that was such an amazing period in my life. Mm. And there I somehow realized that I actually want to pursue a, a career in arts. But mm. then um, I came back from Mexico and I still didn't know what that would mean in practice. So I decided to graduate and like still like look for the direct direction. Mm. And um, after that, I actually had a really inter interesting job in, in Helsinki. But somehow I again had this feeling that I was kind of like fulfilling some other people's dreams, you know, that it wasn't the life that I really want to have. There was like some kind of feeling that something is missing. Like, although like I really enjoyed like the anal analyt how do you pronounce this word? Analytical side of this, this job. But somehow like I felt like because I couldn't use my creativity, it just like felt like there was like a huge gap in my life. And well, actually, like a turning point for me was um, when after graduation, I was writing this article about my final thesis with my branding professor from the university. And uh, my thesis subject was actually visual identity, but like from a strategic point of view. And she actually suggested me that I could apply for a PhD in graphic design because like I, our university, Alto University, was like a big university where you had like business, technology and arts. So because I had a master's degree in business, I was able to apply for the PhD, although I didn't have any experience in, in graphic design. So I applied there and I started uh, to uh, do my PhD, but actually I, I was able to take part in this uh, BA course in graphic design. 
and there something just like I felt like things just fell into place like I just realized that I loved doing what I was doing like we were designing some patterns and like doing well really basic stuff that you do do in the first class of uh, graphic design and I was just like so excited about everything that I just realized that I had like stumbled upon something that would really make me feel alive and it was like worth worth uh, keeping so that's why I decided to go back to school again and like start from the start and like uh, I applied to uh, study BA in graphic design and illustration yeah and that's the long story <laughs> that's not even that long of a story um <laughs> one follow-up question just to because for me I always get asked why did you finish something because I had a bit of the same thing where I wasn't sure if this is what I want to do but I kept going anyway like I didn't drop out of university I finished all the class classes and degrees and for me it was that it was a structure that I could follow it was a really clear path which obviously if you choose to go down the creative path I feel like there is not really a very straightforward way The people like a creative career can be anything and nothing. You have to decide what you make out of it. And that was so scary because a lot of yeah. the other conventional jobs have a really clear, this is what you do and then you'll be successful. And for me, it's like creative work was not, was so unpredictable, then so scary that I didn't know what else to do than to like stay on the path that I was previously on. So I want to know how you feel about that and, How, why? To jump on on that, yeah, yeah as, as well, is that that also means that because the path is not clear, there's no one to advise you necessarily. Yeah. So there's not necessarily a kind of system in place for you to succeed and to feel confident going into a creative career. And I think that's where I'm really also interested to ask you about mentorship and whether that, that was important to you or which kind of, um, you know, guidance you were able to get or if it was purely test and learn and fail, a little, you know, at times <laughs> as well. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I think it was definitely the latter. But I mean, I totally uh, agree with with what what you just said. And I mean, honestly, it was not like an easy decision for me to embrace change because I kind of felt like it was like really difficult for me to hear that inner voice somehow because there were like so many other competing voices. And also like culturally in our society, we have like these terms such as like starving artists, which are not like mm -hmm. that encouraging. And obviously like the longer you've gone down to that path, you kind of, it gets more difficult because there are like sunk costs in a way. And pe people keep telling you like, well, all, you already have this like, like good degree in business and like this good job. I mean, yeah, it was a good job, but it's just like, I felt that it wasn't for me like it didn't mm -hmm. make me happy in the end so yeah um so it's, it is hard <laughs> yeah I feel like it's just like society tells you but you have this good job and you have all these good opportunities why are you throwing that away exactly um so yeah I can completely relate to that and I another think... highlight from what you said as well just jumping on this is that even the PhD in graphic design sounds very academic it was really interesting that you talked about this but it's not some you know something that goes together necessarily where you go and explore but it's still within a framework um that is academic um which ties into a question in the chat actually um Tolu Lope I think <laughs> is looking to have a BA in graphics design Any recommendations from you two? You mean for like schools or? Studying, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of advice, I don't know if you can tell us in the chat if you're applying or if you're just looking uh, for universities or um, any uh, tips from here. But I think generally, you know, where would you start? Um, what was your experience, you know, studying graphics design or anything design related? Well, at least for me, it was really helpful to prepare really well for the uh, application and uh, for the exam I don't know what kind of uh, application processes are there in different schools but at least for me there was like this uh, kind of test where you got a lot of different assignments and you had to like you had like 30 minutes and then you had to draw something or come up with a logo or some kind of idea and uh, for me at least like if you don't have the routine of drawing Uh, I was pretty slow at that, so it was really helpful just to practice a lot before, just to draw so much that the basic stuff comes quite naturally, so that you don't have to think about that in the whole situation, and then you can just focus on like get, like getting coming up with new ideas and and the assign assignments instead of instead of thinking about like how to draw a hand, for example. 
Yeah, that makes me also wonder, and I think co-host Sophia, you can jump on this as well, but how important is your personal work within this, you know, and developing your own identity? And I guess, you know, we've talked about this even on the phone yesterday, co-host Sophia, but, um, <laughs> you know, you, you're kind of, you know, you have your client work, but also trying to find a way for you to still uh, have, you know, freedom of, you know, creative thinking and exploring new things. So how important is that? I think that's a great advice to give to the chat. I definitely think that it's really important because that's kind of like the playground where you can explore things without any pressure. And when you start having a lot of clients work, uh, usually you still have to somehow accommodate to their wishes. And also you usually get hired for the projects that you already have in your portfolio. So although like it could be that you've been like designing for 10 years, but if you want to switch to another direction, it's really helpful to have personal projects because if you just have one example in your portfolio, because many clients actually can't imagine anything, but if they see it in your portfolio, they will hire for you for it. So yeah. I definitely would re recommend like doing as many personal projects as you can. And it's so much fun because you can just like explore new um, techniques without any pressure, because like with clients, you always have this some kind of like deadline or pressure. And it's kind of like you might not want to start learning a new technique for that because you want to know what you're doing. So, yeah, that's def definitely worth exploring. Yeah, I can just echo that completely because I also been told create the work you want to be hired for. Because it's exactly that people go through what you've done in the past and they will ask you to create something similar in that style for whatever they want you to do. So I think, yeah, exploring and trying out things before um, focusing too much on the business side, I feel like, like find out the creative side and then you can go into the business side. And also, if you want to go to school, um, find out some things that interest you, maybe research some people that inspire you, some work that you find inspiring and see what you can take away from that, I guess. And where do you find inspiration, Sophia, as well? That's a really interesting question. Before we move on to the business side, because that's been mentioned already, right? And I'm really interested to see how you created your studio and your experience on, you know, more entrepreneur entrepreneurial, um, you know, advice. But inspiration, interesting topic. You said Mexico, for example, was kind of life changing for you. Um, yeah, I definitely can see traces of my time in Mexico in my portfolio. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, but I think maybe some of the color use comes from there because I remember visiting the house of Frida Kahlo in Mexico City. That was so beautiful, like the blue walls and they had like different objects, like like bright yellow combined with like patterns. I mean, I just love that aesthetics and all the like crafts culture that they have in Mexico. Um, but like in addition to that, I guess, well, to be honest, like in my client work, I really get inspired by the clients. And by that, I mean, like, I really love the Like maybe my like favorite phase in the project uh, in the process of designing a visual identity, for example, is the part where I can like really uh, immerse myself in the topic and like soak in as much information, information as I can. So let's say like the client is, for example, from, I don't know. I'm horrible, horrible at <laughs> coming up with examples, but whatever field they are at, then I can just like, you know, like spend hours researching that field and finding like things that I could use as a, as a, like a visual reference. And I just like, I really, really love learning new stuff. So I really think that's actually the biggest inspiration. And also like somehow I also get inspired by science because it's something I kind of love it how because we use so much like visual inspiration sources like Instagram and Pinterest. But sometimes I think it's a bit dangerous to use only those because you always see the same projects like circ circling around. So it's really good to like try to find some like fresh ideas somewhere. And then if you like start searching uh, inspiration somewhere else, like for example, science, I mean, you could go deep into like how some kind of, I don't know, ice is formed and how it like, what kind of pattern it forms when it's melting or whatever <laughs> i'm not that good in chemistry by the way but but still you can find <laughs> still you can find like inspiration from that and i think that's so amazing because like then you never know what you uh, end up with mm -hmm. 
I love that. And I think we started a bit of a conversation in the chat um, around um, school choice, um, education. There's a, a comeback on the question of choosing, um, you know, BA in design. Um, and our dear Tolu Lope was saying, uh, I already have a BSc or Bachelor of Science, but it's in physics and it doesn't relate to the creative field. Um, so some interesting kind of career change as well here and just exploring something else. Um, Stuart is also saying, I wish I had gone on to a BA. Um, I went to working uh, very quickly. So also a kind of balance between do you start getting this hands-on experience or, you know, do you go towards the educational route and getting as many degrees as you can? Um, a bit of a balance, probably. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a pretty big question. And also, like, I'm also really well aware of, like, the kind of privileged position that I come from, like as a white Finnish person, because like, I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, in Finland, we have a free education system, which is like really amazing. Like all the university studies are free. And I know that's not the case in other countries, but also I think that like now I'm, I really, I really value my education. And I think that that's been really helpful for me, but I also think that you don't need formal education these days because like there are so many amazing resources everywhere on the web and you can basically like learn anything like um, just like, I don't know, taking a course or there are so many good books and so many good podcasts. So I don't think that education is the only, only right route to that. So there might be like really different paths the way you want to be yeah absolutely. and i'm excited to see more work on screen as well uh mm -hmm. we had your your presentation ready um so maybe we can move along a little bit to the studio as well and how you got there uh some of the projects you work on and how the whole idea started because you moved you moved from finland yeah uh yeah absolutely so um so after graduation, actually, I all like I started my studio right away. Like it was four years ago. I don't, I don't know. Like I kind of like I guess I felt because I already had so many so much work experience from like branding and like working with clients. So um, it kind of felt easier for me to start like my own company or my own design studio right like after graduation. And and yeah, so I've been working uh as an art director of my own studio now for four years and maybe i could just so show you some of the uh, projects i've been working on yes please so um so this one was uh it's called villisieni keittakirja in finnish <laughs> i don't know if that tells you anything maybe not so it's uh, the no, we're fine we're good to go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Finns are like sure <laughs> 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 so it's uh, the wild mushroom cookbook that's the english <laughs> can you english say it name? again in finnish <laughs> no i don't <laughs> even know how to say it but it sounds so cool it <laughs> sounds so strange <laughs> it's very cool <laughs> actually a friend of mine who was from australia he once said to me that the finnish sounds like kala 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 <laughs> So. <laughs> which also means fish so <laughs> yeah you know that of course that's yeah. so amazing that Emma is also kala, kala, kala. <laughs> anyway so Today's it's mushroom note. cookbook right yeah so yeah. the client uh, client was Sami Talberg who's a Finnish uh, chef a food writer a forager and uh, I don't know well Emma must know but that in Finland like like um it's really big part of our culture to like pick, pick uh, wild mushroom and berries. We have this thing called uh, every man's right. So basically everyone's free to like roam the forest and pick all the mushrooms and berries that you can find there. Um, but my client Sami, he really didn't like a uh, wish for an ordinary cookbook, but actually the brief was that the book should be uh, psychedelic, magical and elegant. <laughs> so uh, the question for me was like, how can I design a book that kind of like reflects the personality of the author, but also wouldn't scare off the potential buyer who might range from like uh, healthy, aware millennials to like much more conservative baby boomers. So then uh, obviously one solution was like a strong use of, use of color. But also like sometimes when I work with clients, I'm kind of like used to them asking me to sometimes like tone down my color palettes because I really love bold colors. So when I was drafting the first uh, version of the book, I was kind of afraid that Sami, my client, would say that it's like it's way too much. And I sent him the first draft and his answer was like, 
that looks so gray and boring. Like, can you please add more color? <laughs> and yeah, that's when I really realized that I needed to step up my color game in the book. So, and here you can see the results. Um, so I, in addition to these uh, illustrations and really like strong colors, we, um, there was also like, uh, of course, because it was a cookbook, we had to have like a list of key features of the mushrooms and show like a photo for identification of the mushroom. And because there was all this information available in the book, I could be more bold and like uh, psychedelic in the illustrations as the client wished for. He was also talking a lot in the in the writing. He was talking about the like meaty texture of mushrooms. So I kind of aimed for creating this somehow like a beefy structure for the mushrooms. And I combined different techniques. I was actually like hand painting, and I also tried my hand at, at marbling. And then I am um, wow, kind of uh, digitally altered the patterns and then combined them with some vector graphics and then put it all together in Photoshop. So it was quite a long process illustrating the mushrooms, but it was a lot of fun. And then uh, we had this amazing photographer, Olga Popius, who took all the delicious uh, food photos for the book. And it was a really nice contrast to get these dark photos that kind of gave, gave like uh, the book a more like uh, prestigious feeling. Mm. Also, by the way, all these photos for my portfolio are taken by Atte Tanner, who is also an amazing photographer from Finland. You should definitely take, take, check out his work. And um, yeah, I also like I'm such a I love playing with typography. I'm like such a nerd. I, I just love researching and finding new fonts all the time. So in this book, I kind of wanted to um, kind of like mimic the shape of the mushrooms with typography. Like, for example, here you had this we had this uh, these strange mushrooms that look kind of like ping pong ping pong balls. So that, that was that was quite fun. Yeah, that's about it about that project. Do you want me to show another one? Love it already. Yeah, the use of color I was super excited about. Um, and also your kind of use of different fields, you're able to, you know, go into illustration. I, I read a little bit about motion as well. So I'm excited about all the kind of formats you bring together. And this, um, it, it's almost like your childhood, you were talking a bit about scrapbooking. And I love this kind of approach of like piecing things together. And, um, and also a little bit, um, you know, I hope we can talk a bit about your clients and the fact that it's kind of oriented towards environment. You had um, some clients in, you know, biodiversity and requesting some work around that. And, um, you know, the nature of your client and your industry is quite interesting as well. Um, but also festivals and other um, different uh, fields. So any other input, Sophia, Coho, Sophia, anything in the chat? <laughs> um, no more questions, actually. I just wanted to ask you, and I think I saw that question before, but it's, it was more in the beginning, that how do you use your business degree and it kind of dips into the whole business a bit more like how do you benefit now from having studied something else do you use it now um yeah how do you use this to your advantage that you've not gone the straight way to graphic design well that's actually a really good question and i think that on reflection my business studies have helped me a lot. I mean, I know it's like such a cliche with like what Steve Jobs said that you cannot connect the dots beforehand. You can only connect them afterwards, but it's, it's also really true. And I think that happened to me as well, like uh, because like a lot of my clients are, they come from the business environment. And somehow I kind of feel that I, now that with my background, I can kind of like feel like speak the same language as they do. Mm -hmm. And also like growing, because I was studying in business school as well as art schools. And I just, those are really two di really different kind of environments. So somehow, sometimes I feel in my work that I'm kind of like a translator, like translating the uh, the ideas of my clients to visual ideas. And also because I, I personally like struggled to find my own voice. So I feel like now I can help my clients to find their voice and like, turn it into visuals and like visual language. So I think it's been really helpful. And obviously like in graphic design, like the strategic side, it's really important. And I wish this was maybe taught a bit more in, in design school as well, because like, it's not just like designing something pretty, it's all based on the strategic side. And it's really, really essential, I think, to know a lot about it so that you can really come up with concepts that also yeah 
yeah like have meaning for the clients yeah um one follow-up on that also because i'm personally really interested in the answer is was there ever a point where you questioned that decision and had a moment where you're like i'm just gonna go back to business and gonna do a nine to five i don't want to do this anymore <laughs> and Such if an so <laughs> what did you do not to completely um go crazy because this is what happens to me often where I'm like I just I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go back to a very straightforward nine to five <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny that you asked me that because a friend of mine just asked me the same question a couple of weeks ago and I've never thought about going back like never mm -hmm. like from the moment when I just like found the thing that I want to do it kind of felt so natural that I was like Why didn't I and like why didn't I find this earlier? I was like, how mm -hmm. couldn't I not know about this? Because I mean, now it's like so obvious to me that and now like looking back, I realized like already as a kid, a kid I was like interested in like like I said, cutting letters and doing things like that. But um, I mean, I just love it. Like I really love what I do, and yeah, I I kind of feel like I I couldn't do anything anything else. I mean, obviously I could, but. Uh, I'm just so much happier doing what I'm really passionate about because I remember so well how it was working in doing something that is nice and interesting, but not doesn't like light you up <laughs> and the feeling that something was missing. And I think it's like that like unused creativity can be like even really painful. So I think it's like always worth pursuing your passion. And yeah. like, no matter how long you've gone to the path, along the path, I mean, you can always turn back and like find a new direction because there are so many paths to where you want to be. So, yeah, absolutely. The question was also really similar to Sophia's in the sense that if you could change something, would you have, you know, changed anything? Or was there moments that you look back and think, oh, okay, maybe that time I could have taken it another direction, which isn't necessarily giving up and going to nine to five, but, you know, just a, a learning to take away. Um, I don't know, maybe when I was like, uh, at the point when I was like thinking about career change or after a couple of years after I've done the decision and I, I realized that it was the right decision, I think I was kind of regretting like, why didn't I realize this earlier? But then now, like after running my own studio and having all this experience, I kind of feel that maybe things went just the way they were supposed to be like, um, because I maybe I would, wouldn't be here if I did things differently. So, so yeah, and I, I wouldn't want to change anything now. So yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Sounds very healthy. <laughs> yeah. Should we jump on to another project? I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so this one is a, a pretty recent project, a visual identity that I designed for Mikkelis 12th illustration trainer. A fun fact that I was actually born in Mikkeli, so it's, it's a really small town in eastern Finland. And they have this uh, exhibition where they showcase the, like, the best work of Finnish artists, but as well as international artists. So it's a, it's a really amazing exhibition. And um, maybe here the challenge for me was like, uh, how could I, for this visual identity, how could I comprise the breadth of today's artists who create like an astonishing diversity um, and have like so many different styles, techniques and clients, like how can I somehow comprise that to one visual identity? And um, for this project, the, the idea be behind the concept was one paint stroke, paint stroke, which is like a really simple, simple, sorry, paint stroke, but it's like With just one paint stroke, you can actually convey so many things like feelings or movement or texture. And also like you can actually recognize uh, an illustration illustrator style from just like one single paint stroke. So it's kind of like a metaphor as well for like the personal touch behind every illustration. It's funny because Picasso had this one line artwork. Um, oh, yeah, and that's he did true. A lot of that. And that's not necessarily a stroke, <laughs> but it was the challenge of having this one line. Um, yeah, artwork. yeah, that's, that's funny. <laughs> so um, so in the end, I, I created this word mark that is like uh, the letter M that stood for, obviously, for Michaelis 12 illustration trainer. And I created uh, different versions of the word mark, kind of like representing the different illustration styles. So they were like ranging from... I don't know, like lush 
paint stroke to like really detailed vectors vector drawing and then i used this uh, used it as a like a really bold repetitive element in the whole layout of the catalog and in in the visual identity and yeah it was really fun to play play with it and then i also wanted to kind of have like really minimal black and white backdrop for this otherwise vibrant visual identity and also that way, like I was able to showcase the work of the illustrators, which of course was the most important thing. So yeah, that was, that was a really fun project. Um, one question, but just because I'm like completely different profession and I think there are really different ways of working. How do you, when you get a client, a new client and they pitch you their idea or they tell you what they want, how's your process of approaching? You already said that you do a lot of research and um, I know that you're a big fan of structure and I think we're gonna <laughs> dip into that later <laughs> as well. Um, but like, what's your process when you start a project like that? And yeah, what are the steps basically? Well, um, in visual identity pro projects, I usually start after I've had like the initial contact with with the clients, I usually have like a questionnaire that I ask the clients to fill in, like with a lot of questions about their background, their brand, their mission, like th their target group, of course, and their competitors. Sometimes I also organize these like branding workshops, which is a lot of fun. Like before the pandemic, I had a lot of them like in person where we would like also like uh, have a lot of physical objects such as like mood board images and we would spread them on, on the table and I would ask questions about like the colors or the fonts, things like that. And usually after the questionnaire phase, uh, we have kind of like a kickoff meeting where we go through all the answers and dive, dive really deep into their ideas of the brand. And we also talk about the deadlines, of course, and all the practical things. And after that, I usually start creating mood boards. So I just create like a couple of different directions. And there the point is also, I usually try to not send them to the client beforehand because I kind of want to get their authentic reaction. So it's really like, sometimes it could be that they hate something in the mood boards. And that's actually like, it's just great because I really want to get their gut reaction of like how they think about some colors. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just working on, on one visual identity pro project which is like really fun and it was like the mood board phase was actually like it was so useful because uh i the client didn't tell me in the questionnaire that actually she didn't want me to use any plaque and i was so glad that i sent them the mood boards because that's when they told me about like what kind of colors they usually would like go for so it's it's like a it's surprisingly important part of the research to do the mood, mood board so that you can get like the idea of how what kind of visuals the clients mm. like obviously it's not like only about like doing things that the client likes like because they are usually have to be based on a concept but of course the whole final visual identity has to be something that the client can own and think about as they own so it's kind of the balance between um like how much do you want to listen to the client and how much do you want to think yeah. what you think would be the best for the client. So it's kind of like a balance between that. Yeah. And after that, I usually start um, thinking about the concepts and like designing a couple of maybe like three, two to three different concepts for the client. And then they usually pick one concept, which I start refining and we continue working from that. And then oh, design all the applications very briefly but you talked a little bit about before covid so how has the last year kind of changed your process working with clients or just your personal kind of um you know day-to-day -day at studio and running your own business well obviously it was really crazy the year ago when when everything started big like in march i remember i had a lot of projects coming up and like suddenly i just got so many emails like saying that sorry but this project is cancelled so that was like that was not a fun month <laughs> yeah. but um i still feel like i don't want to complain because i still feel i know there's so many people who have suffered so much more from this pandemic and i can't even imagine like people who have like kids and are like juggling their work with homeschooling or something so I feel that it's still been really easy for me in that sense and also I'm I'm being quite grateful especially now in London to have a job like this where I can work mainly digitally and actually somehow even I think it's been an ad advantage that now people are so used to like having video calls and like using zoom or teams or whatever that um 
it's so easy nowadays to have meetings with people who are like overseas or from different countries. So it's not actually only bad things that have come from COVID. Yeah, you have a really healthy approach. And I know you mentioned, uh, I, I think I, I was doing a bit of research before the, the stream and I, I read that you're really into meditation. That's part of your routine as well. So I, I'm sure you want, you know, want to touch on this and habit and uh, those kind of um, day-to-day small adjustments you can make to approach, you know, your life or creativity differently. But firstly, some feedback from the chat. We've got Catherine who's saying lovely illustration here. Um, Donna who's saying it's so nice to have women entrepreneurs in the creative field sharing their experiences. And we have a question around the tools that you also use for your illustrations. So which design tools, um, for example, some of the work you've shown, um, are you using on the day to day? Well, um, like I mentioned uh, with this previous project that I showed, I combine so many different techniques. Like sometimes I use like, uh, well, for example, with this uh, Michele illustration trial, I also started with like a hand made approach so i did a lot of different versions for the stroke with different techniques and then after that i usually alter them digitally so basically photoshop usually but um i usually i also use a lot of illustrator because it's just so straightforward and i mean sometimes in like big branding projects if you do illustrations for them it's just so much easier for everyone that the illustrate illustrations are scalable so that's of course the big advantage so it depends kind of the the end end result, uh, like for example, I had this uh, the visual identity I did for this uh, huge uh, festival, and there I designed the logo as well as illustrations. But then in the end, it was the festival's own team that used all the illustrations and made all the layouts for the festival and all the marketing materials. So for them, it was of course much easier to have like scalable vector illustrations. Mm-hmm. So it kind of depends on the end. Um, where you where where you want to use them so that makes awesome. sense yeah and you give insight already <laughs> more questions <laughs> yeah I have yeah and I think uh, I touched on that already because I think it's so cool you said that um, creativity is more structured than talent I don't know if I'm I'm paraphrasing here it's not I know it's not the exact quote but um, your, and Emma already mentioned it as well, like habits and structure and how does that tie into your work and how, like, what advice would you give people that want to start working in design or generally, I guess it applies to a lot of, a lot of other things as well. What's your thoughts on that and tips and advice? Well, yeah, like, uh, so I, I'm like a really big believer in habits and routines. I actually think that like routines and, stru- they, and structure, they actually give you freedom because they kind of free up the mental space for you. Because like as a creative entrepreneur, there are so many decisions you have to make on a daily basis, like creative decisions and decisions on what kind of clients to take on. And, and it's just so helpful when you have these basic building blocks that are similar each day. And for me, that is really important. And also like, because... Like I said, that I was struggling to find my own voice as a creative. Uh, so creativity wasn't always that easy for me. And I think um, because, for example, like when, when I was in business school, we would like study these huge, thick business books. We had to like memorize them. And then that. we had to... <laughs> and they're done that too. All of the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you go to the exam and your grade is like as good as how well you memorize the book. But like creativity, it doesn't work that way. I mean, it's like but creativity is like working in the dark. It's kind of like, it's terrifying sometimes because you kind of have to expose yourself. I mean, you just like have to come up with ideas and be like vulnerable. And I think that sometimes it's really terrifying and it doesn't help that we come up with these like stories about creativity that, that I think are quite dangerous, that uh, it's all about the talent or it's kind of like a gift or it's like something that this, I don't know, muse hands mm-hmm. to you like or hands to like select few and like because as a creative you are always going to fail like that's the fact so if you're going to think about that as a proof that you don't have any talent I mean you will get that proof so that's why I like to think about creativity more as a skill than a talent that it's like hard work just like anything else and you just have to like show up every day you just have to put in the hours and that that's the thing that matters 
and mm -hmm. for me it's also been really helpful to think more about the um, kind of the verb doing instead of the end result so I don't have inspiration every morning like I, it's not like sometimes I don't feel like working but usually when I start doing something then the inspiration follows so I kind of like the the saying that uh, inspiration follows action because that's how it is I mean you can't just like sit around and wait for inspiration because then you might not never never have it so it's just like so that's why it's really good to have like routines in place that yeah. help you start the work like yeah I completely agree because I also had I think these people have this or like some people have this dreamy idea of creative work being this yeah being kissed by a muse and you just <laughs> sit on like a nice cornfield and wait for ideas <laughs> to come up and um, that it is actually like a lot of hard work and um, I completely um, agree with what you said and I think Maybe you want to share some of your habits or tips for productivity or structures. So any tips for people when it comes to that? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I have a pretty clear structure for my days, but I also want to highlight that that I, I don't think that it it's so important what your routines are. I think it's just helpful to have some. And for of course, for everyone, uh, it, it depends. Like you might need some other kind of routines, but what has been really helpful for me it's been like, uh, um, well, every morning, like, well, I have breakfast. I love breakfast. Love <laughs> and then I, <laughs> yeah. and I, I usually I try to meditate 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the evening. I also actually just like a couple of, well, maybe a month ago, I started a new routine that a good friend of mine recommended to me. And it's like, it's called morning pages. I don't know if you've heard about it, but actually that's even before you get up out of bed, you just like uh, uh, write a couple of pages. And I love it because it's kind of like you're half half asleep still, so it's kind of like your subconscious is still kind of uh, awake. I don't know how you can say, it, but like yeah. you don't have the um, you don't think too much. You just like write everything that comes to your mind, and it's been quite liberating to do that. Mm. And then, um, and in the evenings, I also do this short gratitude practice. So mm -hmm. I try to like write down like from three to five things that I'm grateful for and those are like really small things but I think they for me they've had like a big uh, impact on my well-being and like because I think it's really important also to take care of your mental health as an entrepreneur and like because it's so sometimes it's difficult to separate the uh, the work from the free time so there are small things like this how I can like structure my day and like try to yeah somehow keep the routine so that I don't feel like I, I have to be working all the time so I have to do mm -hmm. something for me to kind of like tell myself like okay now your work day ends and this is how your free time begins yeah I think that uh, ties in quite well with one of the questions in the chat Stuart asks if you work at one project at the time or like multiple projects at the same time I guess then at once exactly yeah, it would be amazing if. Also, a small only... side note: I know um, a couple people on the chat are also having buffering issues, so just want to make sure that everything's going okay. We're trying to uh, get on that, um, but yeah, Sophia, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, it would be amazing just if I could just focus on one project at at one like once. But yeah, usually I do have a lot of projects going on. But I mean, I don't know. Maybe sometimes I feel that it's also good to um do a couple of projects at the same time because sometimes if you work just on the same thing for like eight hours straight you kind of get blind to something so sometimes it's really good to switch like after five hours of doing graphic design it's really fun to do illustration for the next like four hours so yeah <laughs> yep. nice and did you have an additional project where you're every day or every week um and it just becomes swallowed up with the rest of your world um, yeah so yeah really interesting approach <laughs> but sure yeah i All can right. show you the project if you still yeah yeah have, like one final project here yes please um mm -hmm. so um this was a visual identity for a, an event called architectural days it was organized by this association of architects in finland and the theme of this event was in finnish uh, kuri ja järjestys uh, that means uh, order, no, discipline and order in that order. <laughs> and um, 
it was kind of like uh, the name came they kind of uh, had this name because it was kind of referring like tongue in cheek to this recent discussion that we had in Finland about like this boxy ugly architecture and like brutalist architecture which really divides opinions I think well in Finland and I get I can imagine in other countries as well so they kind of wanted to have this like also this identity that would somehow like comment on this theme so um I basically chose this fit typeface for the identity which has like really raw like block like forms and for me it kind of resembled like a condensed city and also like brutalist architecture and I want to make like a really bold and graphic identity and it was really fun to work with the client because they were really open to all my suggestions like about the layouts and I was able to use Pantone colors and yeah I always <laughs> I always appreciate that when I can like experiment with things like that in client work and I also um, designed a pattern from from the typeface that kind of resembles like like a floor plan in architecture I'm not sure if that's the right word but yeah something like that so yeah that was a also a really fun project to work on and I think Emma already asked that but I really want to know how you pick the colors for something like that because I, I love the the pink and the blue and how do you go about actually then putting a foot down and be like this is the color I want to use this is what's going to look like Wow, that's a really difficult question because it's just something that like of course like sometimes or many times the colors come from the project like like i said earlier about the wild mushroom cookbook that mm -hmm. th when i had these photographs photographs of mushrooms i wanted to use colors that would go well together with them like like forest green or pale pink but then sometimes i have projects like these where i can just come up with a color palette like whatever it can be anything basically so um Ah, uh, that's that's a tough question. I don't know. I, I I mean, I have these inspiration mood boards that I say from. So sometimes, if I go to an art gallery, I might take a photo and be like, "Hey, I love this color palette. I'm gonna use it somewhere." So or it can be somewhere when I'm walking down the street and there's like blue wall and like I don't know yellow car in front of the blue wall, and I get inspiration from that. So they can be really random things, honestly. <laughs> no, I love that. Because it's just like, I think a lot of people often think that creative work or design work is some sort of um, like rocket science, but a lot of times it is a bit of like intuition as well. It's trying things, is finding inspiration, even where you don't actually look for it, just being open uh, for new ideas. So I really like that approach. Yeah, I definitely think so too. And I mean, although I said that I do a lot of research, I think that's really important to do in the beginning. But I also like to, if it's possible that, it, that the deadline is not too tight, I also like to kind of like first research and then kind of try to forget the project for a couple of days and kind of like let my you know subconscious do the work. Because usually I think you get the best ideas when you're not like pushing too hard. Mm -hmm. So and if you've done the background work, then you might like just get a really good idea when you're like walking with your friend or having like a discussion so then when you're like more relaxed and um your mind has had like time to rest then you usually come up with the best ideas so yeah and we have the lovely Sandrine in the chat who's telling us that there's a new documentary about the life of Alto who's that will be coming out uh soon so I haven't actually um seen that or any uh, kind of news about it but that's a really one you know really good one to keep an eye out on uh, inspiration wise and just learning wise a little bit about Finnish uh, yeah design <laughs> yeah I would absolutely I really want to see it when it comes out nice I had one final question as well we're reaching time but um I also wanted to ask you about channels and community so we mentioned your Instagram just before the chat but what kind of channels are important for you to network or to put your work out there um and do you have any tips for the audience uh well maybe the biggest tips would be like share your work <laughs> because I know some many creatives are kind of like shy especially when they're like starting out and they think that like oh my my work is not good enough for sharing but it's like it's always better to share your work and you can get comments and you, I mean you never know like how your work might resonate with some people so like just put it out there <laughs> and you can like there's so many amazing platforms nowadays like Behance, Instagram, Working Not Working um, so just like um, yeah show your work <laughs> 
showing off a little bit. I like that. Yes. <laughs> um, so we're almost at time. Any final questions, any tips, uh, Sophia, either Sophia? <laughs> Um, I was just thinking, um, I think we touched on all the topics that I wanted to ask. I feel like I asked a lot of questions that I was really just interested in the, in the uh, answer. I hope everyone else also enjoyed, <laughs> um, my personal investigation <laughs> throughout business and art. Um, no, I don't think I have any more questions, but, um, maybe Sophia wants to, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Final thoughts. Wow, that's that's a difficult one. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> the wisdom. <laughs> Maybe just uh, like uh, listen to your intuition. I think that tells you everything that you need to know. And like, like just yeah, sounds so cliched, like big thoughts like this. But I feel, really wish that people would just like listen to their hearts and follow the path that they want to take. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, both of you. Um, but it was such a pleasure to talk to you and feel refreshed um, with all the work that you've shared and advice for the community. So really grateful for that. Um, and yeah, that's Thank all you so much for today. having me. Thank this you. was so much fun. <laughs> it was so fun talking to that's you guys. Awesome. I hope we can <laughs> see you again. And um, I'm wishing everyone a nice weekend. And we do have streams next week. Um, we'll be off on Monday. So you know, catch up on some replays. If you haven't seen any um, of the masterclasses yet, we've got tons of content out there. Um, but we will be back on Wednesday with a photography masterclass um, and full schedule from then. So thanks everyone. Wishing See everyone a soon. happy weekend Thanks and happy so Friday. Much. Nice weekend. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.